have to understand the context, first of all, in verses 1 through 3, and then also verse 4 and 5. Um, Jesus often used um, physical examples or sometimes used things that were going on in the lives of the people that he was speaking to. And of course, this is appropriate for us to remember when we are looking at God's Word, because God's Word is very practical. So God's Word speaks about issues that pertain to our lives. God's Word speaks about issues that pertain to every one of our lives. And so um, current affairs, of course, are things that, that come up sometimes in the Scripture. And we see here, beginning in verse 1, there was at that time, in meaning in the season that they came, they were coming to challenge him. And when they came, they told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. What he's referring to is something that took place back then where Pilate, of course, who was always at odds with the Jews, he was always doing things that, was, that were offensive to the Jews, had yet done something else, and he caused a protest. What he did was he stole money from the temple of God to finance an aqueduct. And so people gathered together, and when they gathered together to protest, Pilate sent a group of people, Roman soldiers, dressed as civilians, and they mingled within the crowd, literally, and while these people had gone to that place to protest, some going to worship, they then slow, they began to kill the people that, they, that were in the crowd protesting. And as they, they killed them, of course, there was a mingling with those who were worshiping to those who were protesting and those who were being killed. So that's the idea of mingling with the sacrifices. Jesus is speaking to the issue because it was something important to them, and they were saying, what side do you take? Speak out against this. Speak out against this injustice because this wrong has been, been done. Now, of course, we can relate to that because bad things happen. People get harmed. People get even killed. People suffer atrocities. Why does God allow it? And so their point was, in speaking to Jesus, was a strong challenge saying, what do you say? Now, it was a trap because if Jesus said, well, this is wrong, then we need to speak out against these atrocities, then they're going to say, you're against Caesar. Arrest him. But if he says nothing, then what they're going to say is, you're pro-Roman. Ignore him. And so he ignores the issue completely, and rather he speaks to the cause. He speaks to the real issue. Notice what he says there in verse 2. Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? What he's saying is this. Did it happen because they were sinners? What he's actually saying is no. Now, they are sinners. We're all sinners. But it just happens. In this case, it happened because Pilate's a sinner? It happened because those people Pilate ordered were sinners? No. It just happened. That's the idea. It happens because bad things happen because sin enters the world. And because sin entered the world, of course, this world is in a fallen state. And because it's in a fallen state, of course, now sin abounds. And so what he's saying is, no, this didn't happen because these people were sinners, but Here's the point. Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because these things happened? Of course not. Notice verse 3. I tell you no, but unless you repent, you all likewise perish. He goes on, and notice in verse 4, he says, Of those 18 on whom the tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? What's he saying here? Well, again, he's saying, look, here's this situation where people were wronged, they were killed, murder took place. Were those people who were murdered worse sinners than other people who weren't murdered? Of course not. But it happened. Then he goes on and he says this. Here there, there are people that were just simply working. Eighteen men who were working near the Tower of Siloam. The, the, the tower fell. It fell on top of them. They died. Were they worse sinners than other people in that area? Of course not. What he's saying is this. What he's saying is we see tragedy take place. We see all these horrible things take place. We see people suffer, people being persecuted. We see people being taken advantage of. We see people trafficked. We see people tortured. We see people wronged. We see people killed. And we say, where's God? And we say, why does God allow it? And what Jesus is saying is, you're asking the wrong question. The question is not, why do people suffer and die? The question is, why do I have the right to live? Think about that for a moment. His point is, we're all sinners. Every single one of us. And the bottom line is, we need salvation. 
We need to experience the love and the grace and the mercy of God rather than looking out at all those things and saying, it's wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong, or like we talked about last week, rather than looking out at all the things in the world and saying, whoa, 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 whoa. When we experience the Lord, when we really come face to face with the living God, what happens with Isaiah? The same thing that should happen with us. When we see God high and lifted up on his throne, he's in control, he's in charge. We don't look out at all those other things, at all those problems. We don't question God. We don't test him. We simply say, woe is me. I'm undone. And I live in the midst of a people with an unclean lips. And I have unclean lips. Meaning this, why do these things take place? Why do all of these atrocities happen? Why is there suffering in the world? It's because Adam and Eve sinned. And because they sinned, a world that was made by God to be perfect, that he says over and over again, it is good, it is good, it is good, it is perfect. Now all of a sudden, it's bad. It's messed up. It's turned upside down. Because of sin. You say, well, I didn't sin. I wasn't there in the garden. We are born in sin. But even if we had a completely clean slate after we'd been born, we sin. Every one of us. We make a decision to sin. Who here sins? Raise your hand, please. Right? We all sin. Every single one of us sin. And if you didn't raise your hand, you're a liar, and that's a sin. Right? <laughs> so you got got. Right? We are sinners, every single one of us. And that's why we need a Savior. We need the Lord to do a work of saving us. But that means there needs to be something that takes place. Listen, sin is bad. Every one of us sins and sin is bad, and that means we have consequences in our lives. It was Benjamin Franklin who said this, sin is not bad because it's forbidden. It's forbidden because it's bad. Meaning this, God knows that sin hurts, that sin causes damage and ultimately will cause destruction. And that's why he wants us to repent of our sin. He wants us to avoid sin. He wants us to choose something different. Now, we are always going to be sinners. Nothing's ever going to change that until we come to glory. When we die, we're glorified by Jesus Christ. And the same grace that saved us is that same grace that's working in us that one day will perfect us. That's a wonderful truth. But that same grace is working in us now. And what that means is this. I don't see anywhere in the Bible that it says that we stop sinning after we give our lives to Jesus Christ. I do see in the Bible that we have the opportunity to have our sins forgiven after we have said yes to Jesus Christ. That if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I also see in the book of Romans a wonderful truth that says, do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness, which means this. I have a choice. You have a choice to not transgress, to not willfully sin. Meaning this, there are certain things that will just happen. They're just going to come out of your mouth without even thinking. You weren't tempted, it just took place. There are certain things you do that you didn't mean to do, still sin. But those things that you know are sin and you're tempted to do it and you have a process of time to choose to do it or not, you don't have to choose to do it. You've been set free. We have a new nature. And this means that God, by his grace, has saved us, not by works, but he has saved us by his work. And one day he's going to glorify us, not by works, but by his work. But in between is this thing called sanctification. It's a fancy word for growing up. And what that means is that we have a decision to make to choose to follow after the Lord or to choose to go after sin. And if we choose to go after sin, there's consequences. Sin is bad for a reason. Parents' rules are given not to rip you off, not to keep you from something fun. If you have a good parent that's giving you good rules, those rules might be something like this. Don't go out on the 15 freeway. A parent might say to their child, 8 years old, 9 years old, don't go out on the 15 freeway and go walk out there for you know, kicks. Stay home. Be safe. Walk on the sidewalk. Don't cross the street in the midst of traffic. They're not trying to rip you off from some, from some incredibly exhilarating experience. They care about you. They don't want to see you harm. If the society is good, the society's rules are good to say to you, don't take advantage of people, don't steal from other people, don't do this or that because you wouldn't want those things done to you. It's not trying to rip you off from something that's good, from something that's amazing, something that's satisfying. God's rules are the same. Every one of them are given to bless us. Every one of them given to keep us from something that would cause us harm or someone else harm. 
It also is something that is given so that we don't fill our hands up or fill our arms up with something bad which rips us off from something good. Because every time we choose to sin, what we're doing is we're grabbing a hold of something less than that keeps us from something that's best. When we sin, we're choosing to take something that does not satisfy and we forfeit something God wants to give us that would have satisfied our life. And so there's a decision to make. And we need to understand that sin is bad. But we also understand that we sin. And when we sin, we need to understand how bad it is. The problem is we just can't seem to understand how bad it is. And I think that's why we're prone to wander. Sin, biblically, is pictured as leprosy. So leprosy is a type of sin. Now, I have to say this. I spent some time with some lepers in India several years ago, and they were wonderful people. We spent some time with them, doing some work with them, and we got a chance to fellowship with them, have a meal with them. It was wonderful. As we spent time with them, these were, were lepers who had been saved. They loved Jesus Christ. And they were growing in their walk with the Lord. And, and when we started sharing this meal, and we, we brought a lot of ingredients, and they, they cooked it with us, and it was a big meal, the first thing they wanted to do was, was wait, not just to pray. They wanted to wait to offer up their food to the neighboring leper colony that were filled with unsaved people. Unsaved people who, by the way, because they were not Christians, received all sorts of government help and had way more food than they had. And so they got so excited, so giddy, they said this. They said, let's go across the street and let's, let's bless our neighbors. Let's bring them food. And so we crossed the street. And I remember thinking, I, I never want to forget what this looks like, watching these people, many of them who could barely walk struggling to carry things that they really shouldn't have been carrying as they're crossing the street to try to bless their neighbors. And when we got there, we had this amazing feast, this wonderful time with them. And as we enjoyed this, this wonderful food, wonderful fellowship, great conversation with these brothers and sisters and also with these people we just met, they asked, that is, the leper colony of non-believers asked if they could hear the gospel. And so we shared the gospel, and I'll never forget what it looked like as the sun was going down, and they gave an opportunity for people to pray to receive Christ, to have their sins forgiven. I asked them if they wanted to repent, if they were ready to see God deal with the problem of their sin, once and for all. Raise your hand. And I saw a bunch of hands raised. And as they raised their hand, you could just see, you know, the darkness of the silhouette. As they raised their hand, all of a sudden I see a few with missing fingers. You know, some with no fingers at all. Some with a shriveled hand that couldn't extend. And I thought, how beautiful that is, to see a sinner repent. How beautiful it is to see when someone turns away from their sin and God makes them a new creation. Listen, God could do that in your heart this morning. He can forgive you of any sin. He can forgive you of anything you've done. He can set you free from any life-dominating sin. Maybe you've tried to get rid of it. Maybe you tried to push against it. Maybe you tried to say no, but you couldn't. You can't. You can't clean yourself. You can't pull yourself up. You can't be better. You simply go back into that same thing over and over again. You have no help. You have no hope outside of Christ. But in him, he is your hope. In him, he is your help. And he can forgive anything we've done. Amen? It's true. He can forgive anything that we've done. And so we need to understand that sin is pictured like leprosy. But what does that mean? Well, here's what it means. It starts beneath the surface. Sin starts beneath the surface just like leprosy does. James 1, 14 says that we're tempted when we're drawn away by our own desires and enticed. It's an inward thing. It's a secret thing. It's deep inside. Secondly, it grows in secret. James 1, 15 says when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. The idea is that sin begins almost like a seed, a pregnancy. But then it grows up, and as it grows, of course, it grows into an ugly baby. And so it starts beneath the surface, it grows in secret, then it deadens the nerves. Well, you no longer have feeling. That's what happens with leprosy, but it's also what happens with sin. We no longer have feeling or sensitivity. We no longer care about things we should care about. We can hurt people and not even care about it. We can do things and not feel bad about it. Ephesians 4.19 says that those who experience that are past feeling. It also causes separation. Isaiah 59 verse 2 says your sins have separated you from your God. But listen, our sins separate us from people we love. Our sins can separate us from all people. Sin separates. It's also contagious. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33 tells us that. That bad company corrupts 
good morals or good behavior. It also kills. Ezekiel 18 verse 4 says, the soul that sins shall surely die. Now that's sin. And of course, leprosy is pictured as sin. But it's important to understand this. Leprosy is 100% treatable. And so is sin. 1 John 1 9 tells us, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, listen, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He takes away all of our sin. He washes us clean as if it was never there before. Amen? That's what he does. Simply because we confess our sins, we come to him and we confess our sins, we admit that what we've done is wrong, and we say, God, I can't handle it. I can't deal with this on my own. Would you forgive me? Would you cleanse me? And he does. And he can do that for us today. He can cleanse us of our sin. Now, Matthew 3, verse 8, tells us something that's really important. We have to understand this. Repentance means literally to change our mind. And then Matthew 3, verse 8, tells us that, that those who sin should bear the fruit of repentance. That means this. There's evidence that we've repented. Now, this is really important, so please hear me on this. I think that one of the greatest lies that has been accepted, especially in the American church, is this that you simply pray a prayer and now you're saved. You pray a prayer and ask Jesus into your heart, we say, and now you're saved. I don't see that anywhere in Scripture. I don't see one example of Scripture when someone asks Jesus into their heart and they're saved. Now, it's an image I understand. It's an image that may be useful for some, but that idea that somehow we just simply pray a prayer and now we're saved, it doesn't save us. There are those that say they know the truth. That doesn't save them. There are even those that say they believe the truth. But the Bible tells us in the book of James that even the demons believe and tremble. So there's something that has to happen. There's something that must take place for a person to be saved. And here's what it is. We believe upon the name of Jesus Christ. And that's the only name by which we might be saved. But that belief is attached to repentance. They are really, in essence, connected. And the idea is that repentance is not a U-turn changing our direction because we can't do that. We can't change ourselves. Repentance is a change of mind. And this happens coupled with faith. That all of a sudden, there's an experience that we have whenever we have it. And when that happens, boom, just like that, you are saved. What's that look like practically? How do we put shoes on that? Jesus said to the man we talked about last week with a withered hand, stretch out your hand. But he couldn't. And he could have been thinking all the while, but my condition, I've been stuck in this place for a long time. I can't stretch out my hand. He could have been thinking, why is he saying that? Why is he telling me to do something I clearly can't do? <laughs> well, maybe he's not kind. Maybe he's not gracious. Maybe he's not powerful. Maybe he's all these different things. He has the wrong thinking about his condition. He has the wrong thinking about God. He may have the wrong thinking about himself. Repentance happens when a person changes the way they think about God. They change the way they think about themselves. They change the way they think about their condition, their behavior. And they recognize this. I am not okay. And I can't change that. And the things that I do are wrong, and I can't stop doing it. I'm unable, but God is. And then repentance mixed with faith takes place. I believe God is able. I believe he's good. And I believe he can deal with the problem of my sin. That's how that connection happens. For the man with a withered hand, something had to change inside of him. He had never been healed before. He had never stretched out his hand. And Jesus says, stretch out his hand. And he says this in his heart of hearts. Okay. What did he do? He believed Jesus was able to heal. He believed that Jesus' words mattered. Okay. And the message was sent from his brain to his hand. Stretch out. And the Bible says, and as he began to stretch out his hand. Think about this. As he began to stretch out his hand, which was a thing he was not able to do. In that nanosecond, he's made whole. Guys, that's what happens when through faith, with repentance, we come to God. And we say, I'm not able, but I'm in this condition, and I'm calling out to you, Lord, 
and I believe. And in that moment, we truly believe, not when we say we believe, but in that moment, we truly believe salvation has come. But if salvation has come, there will be fruit. See, I remember a day when my beautiful wife walked down the aisle. And that's something I never want to forget because I remember when she walked down the aisle, she looked amazing. And there was no one else in the room. It was her and me and just a bunch of fuzzy faces. And as she walked down the aisle, I thought, this is really happening. This is amazing. I've been waiting for this day for a long time. I love her with my whole heart. And as we began the whole process of the ceremony, I don't remember most of it because I was distracted by her. But I do remember when I was asked to give a consent question, will you take Victoria Cartiglia, that was her name before, to be your lawfully wedded wife, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better or for worse, in sickness and health, for richer or poorer, sometimes a lot poorer, okay, till death do you part? I heard that. And what I did was this. I do. Absolutely. I do. As far as I was concerned at that point, boom, it happened. We're married. I do. Now, if I did, then my life would show it. But I don't have to try it. I don't have to put you know, in my phone reminders that say, kiss Vicky. I want to kiss her all the time. I'm preaching right now and I want to kiss her. <laughs> it's holy. I don't have to put their, hey, well, tell you you want to spend time with her. I want to spend time with her all the time. I can tell you this. We're going to celebrate our 25th wedding anniversary in February. And, and the fact is this. There's never been a time that I haven't wanted to be with her. And though I love being a pastor and I love going to work, I love it. Every single time I get up to go to work, it's a sacrifice in my heart. Because I'd much rather hang out with her. I'd much rather be with her. And when I go, I'm thinking, okay, I'm thinking, I can't wait. I get to go home. I want to be with her. Even though I'm doing something I love and even though I'm committed to doing it, I want to be with her. It's the byproduct of meaning I do. I think the problem in a lot of marriages is when people say, I do, they didn't. And when it comes to our faith in Christ, that's the same. There are many people who go to church, many people who sit in pews, many people who sit in the seats who even are involved in serving in ministry, who say they have given their life to Jesus Christ, but they did not give their life to Jesus Christ. They did something else. I don't know what it is. I don't even think we need to talk about what they did, but whatever they did wasn't it. It wasn't the way it's supposed to be. They knew the right things. They may have done a lot of the right things, but they did not believe the right way. There was not faith mixed with repentance. And so they've simply said the right words, but they do their own thing. And so when someone comes up to them and says, how can you live like this and call yourself a Christian? How can you believe that way and call yourself a Christian? How can you hold those views about unrighteous things and call yourself a Christian? They'll say, I pray to prayer. But that will not save you when you stand before a holy and living God. There has to be something different that takes place in each one of us. And it only happens when faith is mixed with repentance when we truly have, in fact, given our life to God and we said, you are in charge, you're in control, and I've taken my hand off the wheel. I'm not steering anymore. I've gotten off the throne. I'm not in charge anymore. I've given you the keys. It's your home. I just live here. That has to happen. But if it hasn't happened, then I don't know what we are, but we're not a Christian. We're not where we need to be. And so Jesus is talking about this idea of repentance, and he's looking for it as he's talking about approaching this fig tree to find fruit. And there are three things here that we see, that we must see about the Lord's heart when it comes to the issue of repentance, and that's this. God is looking for the fruit of repentance. God is yearning for the fruit of repentance, and God is waiting for the fruit of repentance. Let's go through those real quickly. God is looking for the fruit of repentance. Notice verse 6. He also spoke this parable, a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. God has a vineyard, the earth is the idea. And he comes seeking fruit, and yet, sadly, oftentimes, he's found none. 
And we need to understand what repentance is. What is that fruit he's actually looking for? Because sometimes that can be confusing. Acts 3, verse 19, the apostles are speaking to a crowd of people, and as they're speaking to them, hearts are pricked. God's working, and all of a sudden they ask, what do we do? And in Acts 3, verse 19, Peter says, Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Listen to these words. We need them today. Repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Listen, we need these words because you might be in sin and there might be someone who's been in sin and when you find yourself in that place where you've been in sin, you feel miserable or it's miserable that you don't feel at all. And when you're stuck in that place, you either don't know what it's like to live or you've never lived. And what he's saying is this, repent and be converted so your sins are dealt with, they're gone. And then he says this, so that times of refreshing may come. What is that? What's a time of refreshing? What's been hot here? And I realize that we in Utah probably don't have a lot to complain about because sometimes Utahs complain about traffic. If you're not from California, you shouldn't talk about traffic, right? And when it comes to hot, we complain about hot, but some of you are from Phoenix or Tucson, Arizona, and you think, this is not hot. Trust me, this is not hot at all. But for me, it's been hot. And it was hot last week, and I was riding my motorcycle, and I have to admit, even though I love riding my motorcycle, it wasn't fun to ride in the heat because it was so hot, and I got stuck in traffic. And being on a motorcycle in traffic when it's hot isn't really fun. And so I'm sweating, I'm uncomfortable, and I show up over here at the coffee shop down the street where I like to do some work. As I walk inside, I felt you know, the, the air conditioning, so it was a little bit cooler, but it wasn't cool enough because it only reduces it by maybe 10, 15 degrees. And so it wasn't that cool, and I felt like I need something, something, right? And so I went up to the counter, and I saw this thing, and it just was calling me. Oh, take me, take me. What was it? It was a white guava tea with lemonade. And I thought, I don't know what white guava is. I've never had it before. But in the picture, it looked cold. And so I said, is it good? And she said, oh, it's really good. She started talking about it. While she's talking, I go, I want it. Just give it to me. I'll take a Trenta, which I don't know what that means, but it's the big one. And so she makes it for me, and she gives it to me. I thought, wow. Wow, it was so good. That was awesome. It was so good, I had one a couple hours later. Right? It's refreshing. It was refreshing. Now, I have no idea if it's good for me. It probably isn't good for me. But it was refreshing. Listen. When we repent, the Lord blots out our sin and then he refreshes and it's always good for you and it lasts. He refreshes our soul and that's why we repent because he makes us right with him and he blesses us. Now, it does not say clean up your act, knock it off, square yourself away. It doesn't say that. It simply says repent. God gives you and I something we can do. Change your mind. Repent. Converted means U-turn. We don't make a U-turn. We don't make a U-turn when we come to God the first time. We don't make a U-turn when we're coming back to God. We don't make a U-turn when we've had a horrible day and we recognize we live for ourselves and we said, God, we repent. Forgive me. We don't make a U-turn. We repent. We change our mind and God changes our direction. What it means is this. We come to God and we do the only thing we can do, a very simple thing, repentance mixed with faith. I changed my mind, God, and I know you're able. Take care of it, please. And he converts. We change our mind. God changes everything else. That's what happens. But we need to understand what it is. What is repentance? It means, again, to change our mind. But it's not about tears. Hebrews 12. Turn there with me, please. Hebrews 12. It's not about tears. Sometimes people, you know, they cry and they cry and they cry or they feel horrible about what they've done supposedly. So they cry and they cry and they cry. I've had people apologize to me for things before where they cry and they cry and they cry. But I've had people who've apologized for things before and they cry and cry and cry and you say, okay, I forgive you. And then they do the exact same thing again. And then they do it again and they cry and they cry and they cry. And they say, forgive me. And you do. And they do the exact same thing again. That's not repentance. That's crying. And repentance is not about crying. Hebrews 12, verse 17, speaking about Esau, who was a man of the flesh, 
who was not saved. Notice what it says in Hebrews 12, verse 17. For he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. Do you see that? He found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. Repentance is not about tears. Repentance is not about words. Turn over to 1 Samuel, please. 1 Samuel chapter 15. Sometimes people go to people with all sorts of words to try to impress them or convince them, I really feel sorry about this thing. I'm not going to do it again. And sometimes people do the same thing with God. They go to God and having all the right words written out and maybe read them to God in a prayer. But just having the right words doesn't cut it. Notice, repentance is not about tears, but it's also not about words. 1 Samuel 15, notice verse 24. Saul is speaking here, and it says, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now, therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. Now, that sounds spiritual, even refers to worship, but listen, there was no repentance, none whatsoever. And that day he lost the kingdom, and really not that long after, he'll lose his life because he did not find repentance. And sadly, as he dies, there appears that he lost the hope of any salvation. So, we have to understand, it's not about tears, it's not about words. Listen, it's not about sorrow. Say that again. It's not about tears, it's not about words, and it's not about sorrow. What? Notice Matthew 27, verse 3. Matthew 27, verse 3. We know that Judas did horrible things. We know that Judas had sins in other ways besides betraying betraying Jesus. But we know that what Judas did in betraying Jesus was the lowest thing of all low things that people would do. It makes him the son of perdition. Meaning this, the son of destruction. It was said of him, it'd be better if he had never been born. But notice this. It's not about tears. It's not about words. And it's not about sorrow. Matthew 27, verse 3, it says, Judas was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and elders. Wow. If it's not about tears, if it's not about words, if it's not about sorrow, then what is repentance about? It is about your will. It is your will, it is my will subordinating to God and saying, I am not in control and I know that to the deepest part of who I am. I'm not in charge. God is in charge of me. And I say that with as much fervor as I can. He's in charge, which means he calls the shots. So I don't give lip service to saying, I prayed about that, or I think I'll do that if the Lord wills. No, I mean it, because he's purchased my life. Yes, he made me. He created every single one of us, but he also purchased us. And I've been bought with a price, which means my body is not my own, but I belong to God. And he's in charge, and what he says goes. Amen? If we can say that, repentance has come. Because we've recognized we're not in charge. We're not the king of our own life. God is. And when we give him control, then something has happened. When we give him control, he takes charge and he makes us a new creation. And we want to give you an opportunity to experience that if you never have this morning. To say, I've tried it my way. Have you? I've tried it my way and it doesn't work. I've tried it my way. And I'm not happy, I'm not content, I'm not fulfilled, I know I'm not okay. God, it's your turn. Take control. And when he does, blessings will follow. And so it's not about tears, it's not about words, it's not about sorrow. It's about a change of mind. We let the Lord do his work. And remember this. Remember that when we give him control, we don't take it back. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10 says, For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted. I mean, it is not to be taken back. We give him control. And when we've given him control 100% in our hearts, knowing we won't take it back, that's repentance. That's genuine repentance. And when that happens, salvation has come again.
Sin and leprosy, very similar. It starts beneath the surface, it grows in secret, it deadens nerves, it causes separation, it's contagious, it kills, it's 100% treatable. Leprosy is 100% treatable with multi-drug therapy. Several antibiotics that are taken over the course of a couple of years eradicates the disease. But once you start, you have to complete it. If you don't start it soon enough, it's too late. And if you don't complete it, it comes back. And so God is looking for the fruit of repentance. God is yearning for that same fruit of repentance. Real quickly, notice verse 7. Then he said to the keeper of the vineyard, Look, for three years I've been coming seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? God is coming, and he's looking. Notice for three years. By this time, it should have produced fruit. He keeps coming. As he keeps coming, it's showing he's yearning for fruit. The same thing is true about the Lord, and we need to understand his heart. We need to understand that we have a Father in heaven who loves us. God the Father himself loves us. Now, I know that's hard for some of you because maybe you had a tough experience with your father, but we need to understand God the Father loves us. Personally, I remember two times I saw my father cry as I was growing up. One was at his father's funeral. As he stood there, standing there looking like he's 10 feet tall in my eyes, my hero. I look up at him and I see no quiver in the lip, nothing like that, just a solitary tear run down his cheek. And I remember just thinking, wow. I felt the same way when he used to grab, you know, you know cans, you know, beer cans or soda cans and crush them on his forehead and go, check this out. I thought, wow, that's amazing. And I couldn't do that. I tried to do it and grab it and walk around the corner, boom, fall back on the ground, have a big circle on my forehead. And he could do anything in my life. And watching this guy who's big and strong cry, I was moved. But it was just one tear that came down. It was not long after I was at a baseball practice because he was my coach. And somebody was messing around with the bat. And as they were messing around with this bat, they were swinging away just kind of indiscriminately. And they hit me. And they got me square in the gut. And it hit me right here. And I fell on the ground. And it was horrible. And I was in pain. And I'm moaning on the ground. And I saw my dad rush up to me. And he looked down at me. And tears were in his eyes. And his lip was quivering. He was overwhelmed. And he picked me up. He wanted to make sure I was okay. He took me off to the side, and he was still emotional. And he looked me in the eye, and he said this, I can't explain it to you, but it hurts me to see you hurt. Do you understand that? It hurts me, he said, to see you hurt. And this is all I thought. Wow. He loved me. It hurts God to see you in sin. It hurts God to see your circumstance. It hurts God to see you give up wonderful things for something that's less than, wonderful things for something that hurts you, wonderful things for something that's garbage. It hurts him. It hurts him to see the effect of your sin or my sin. It hurts him to see the consequences coming, the heartache, the wreckage. It hurts him. And so he's yearning for repentance. He's yearning for it. He desires all men to be saved. He desires people to repent. And he has goodness and forbearance and long-suffering towards us. And that kindness should lead us to repentance. Longs for us. There's no other way for me to describe it except this. How many of you saw World Wrestling Federation growing up? Even if you didn't mean to? Even if you feel guilty about it? Come on, raise your hand. Who saw it? Who knows what it is? World wrestling. Okay. No, it's not real, but that's not the point. Okay? If you've ever seen it, which I remember seeing it growing up as a kid, and you see all these like larger-than-life characters, and, and I could tell, I mean, obviously it's not real, but, but you see somebody in the ring, and they're just getting worked over like crazy. They're getting picked up and body slammed. They're, they're dropped on their head, and they're, they're punched, and they're kicked, and all these different things take place, and there's somebody else on the side who's doing this. They're reaching out. So that the person who's just, you know, getting wrecked would see them. They're reaching out, and they tap. And as soon as they tap, the other person comes in. And they come in, and they dominate. Now, I know that the whole thing is a drama. I know that's all planned out. But it's not a game. It's not a story. It's real life that's going on for us when we are being wrecked. We are being thrown around this way and that way, and we're being body slammed by the enemy. We're being body slammed by our sin. We're being body slammed by our flesh. 
and we are not strong enough. And God the whole time is saying, just tap, tag me, just tag me. All I need you to do is tag me, just tag me. And if we tag him, he comes in and he rescues us. That's what it means when it's saying that he's yearning, he's desiring. Think about this because I know what it's like to see my kids hurt. I know what it's like to see them scrape their knee. I know what it's like to see them have, you know, a stomach pain or a flu or whatever. And any of us as parents would in a second take that sickness for them if we could. But we can't. And God, when he looks at us, he sees us in our sin and he sees the consequences of it. And he sees that it's wrecking havoc on our life. Even if we're so far in the sin, we don't even recognize it. And he's saying, I would take it if I could. And so he did. He has borne our iniquities. By his stripes we are healed. He who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. To receive that, all we have to do is tag. We tag him. And we say, God, take it. And he comes in. You do that today, and he will take away your sin. You do that today, and he'll make all things right. He'll make all things new. To forgive us of everything we've done, and he makes us a new creation. Because if any man be in Christ, the old things have passed away. All things have become new. He's a new creation in Jesus. And so God is looking for the fruit of repentance. He's yearning for the fruit of repentance. But lastly, God is waiting for the fruit of repentance. But he answered and he said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it, meaning until I work it and fertilize the ground. And if it bears fruit, well, meaning good. But if not, after that, you can cut it down. It's important that we understand something that's very key. When it comes to the issue of our sin and the offer of forgiveness through repentance, God is waiting for the fruit of repentance, but he will not wait forever. Isaiah 55 verse 6 says this. Listen to these words. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and your ways are not my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. What's it saying? Here's what it's saying. You would not forgive you. You would be done with you. You'd be finished with you a long time ago. You would have given up on you, but I'm not like that. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. Think about that. What it means is whatever we've done, however far we've gone, however deep the pit we're in, God is still able to reach us, and he will forgive us. But don't miss the first part. Verse 6 says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near, meaning there is a point in time where he cannot be found. There is a point in time where it is too late. Leprosy is 100% treatable, 100%. But there is a point in time where it is too late and the damage is done and it's irreversible. There is a point in time where it's too late and the person will not be responsive to the medication. Sin and leprosy, same. They start beneath the surface, it grows in secret, it deadens nerves, it causes separation, it's contagious, it kills, and it's 100% treatable. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So to recap, God is looking for repentance. God is yearning for repentance. God is waiting for repentance. There's no reason to wait any longer. Because God is here. And if we call upon the Lord, then we will know that we are answered. As God is quick to forgive, ready to heal. And he's greater than our sin. Amen? He is greater than our sin. Again, it starts beneath the surface. It grows in secret. It deadens nerves, causes separations, and it's contagious, and it kills. And it's 100% treatable then why is leprosy more common today than it was 50 years ago? Why is it growing? Why is it spreading? 
There's only one answer to the question. When a person is diagnosed with leprosy, they don't go back to the doctor. Because in every culture in the world, leprosy is shameful. Because leprosy is seen as being a type of sin. And this is the same thing people do with their sin. They're thinking that somehow what they've done is too bad. What they've done is too hard to forgive. What they've done is, is too shameful to mention. And so it grows beneath the surface. We need to remember something that the Lord has said. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Meaning this, we come as sinners. We might come feeling horrible. We might come being ashamed. But we leave with our head held high. We leave having been washed. We leave having been cleansed, having been made right with God, so that we, though we were sinners, are saved by grace, now come boldly before that throne to talk to God who loves us dearly. That's what happens when repentance has taken place. Let me finish with this. Malcolm Muggeridge was working as a journalist in India when he left his residence to go to a nearby river for a swim. As he entered the water across the river, he saw a beautiful silhouette of a naked Indian woman from a nearby village who had come to bathe. Muggeridge impulsively felt the allurement of the moment and temptation stormed into his mind. He had lived with this kind of struggle for years, but had somehow fought it off in honor of his commitment to his wife, Kitty. On this occasion, however, he wondered if he could cross the line. She was far away. Nobody would know. He struggled for a moment and then swam furiously toward the woman, literally trying to outdistance his conscience. His mind fed him the fantasy that stolen waters would be sweet, and he swam the harder for it. Now just two or three feet away from her, he emerged from the water, devastated as he looked at her. He wrote later, She was hideous, and her skin was wrinkled, and she was a leper. This creature grinned at me, showing a toothless mask. The experience left Malcolm Muggeridge trembling and muttering under his breath, what a dirty, lecherous woman. But then the rude shock took over. And he said this, it was not that woman who was lecherous. It was my own heart. We need to understand how bad sin is. But once we're convinced of it, we need to understand how good God is. We have a God who's incredibly good. You, O oh Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious and long-suffering and abundant in mercy and truth. Would you stand with me?